Hello fellow sim racers, and welcome to the final part of this sim racing setup guide. This video details how I built a setup for the Audi R8 GT3 car in Assetto Corsa, thereby putting into practice some of the things we've talked about over the last 11 videos. If you've not seen any of the earlier parts of this series, then a link to a playlist containing all of my setup videos should be in the top right hand corner of your screen. Before we get into the thick of it, a word about what this video is and, more importantly, what it isn't. If you're here hoping to find a hot lapping setup for the Audi, then you're out of luck. The purpose of this video is to take you through how I built a race setup and discuss the reasoning behind the choices I made. And ultimately, it's a setup that's built to suit my driving style, so the chances of the exact same setup working for someone else are pretty slim in my experience. I chose the Audi because it's a popular car and frankly the stock setup's a bit of a pig, but more on that later. My reasoning behind using Donington National is entirely selfish. It's a track I really enjoy, but more importantly it's a short lap which works better for the format of this video. So let's get started by taking a look at how the Audi performs out of the box. The stock setup for the Audi has some issues. The biggest of which is chronic oversteer in every part of the corner. It's got mild turn-in oversteer, as well as a decent helping of power oversteer, despite the traction control being set pretty high by default. And on top of that, it has a bit of a lift-off oversteer problem as well. All in all, it's a car that inspires very little confidence through the corners. And then there's the common problem that Assetto Corsa GT3 cars all seem to have, in that it's allergic to kerbs. The final issue is the gearing, which I presume was set up for the Nordschleifer, as it's rather tall. So tall, in fact, that there's no need for sixth gear here at Donington. So, I decided to build a sprint race setup, mainly because it would make sense to keep the fuel levels and tyre compound the same as the default setup. That way I'm comparing apples to apples. 30 litres and medium tyres are ideal for a 20 minute sprint race. Now, a word about lap times. After a bit of practice, I was able to lap the national circuit in 1 minute 6 seconds flat on the default setup, but it wasn't a comfortable experience. And looking at the RSR leaderboards, a good hot lapping time is in the low 1 minute 4 bracket. So that gives a bit of context to the lap times that I'm going to mention throughout the video. The sessions I'm using to build the setup are at 3pm with an air temperature of 22.5 degrees on a track with optimum grip. So the first job's to get the tyres working properly. The default setup has cold pressures set to 17 all around, which equates to hot pressures ranging from 23 to 25 psi. This is a bit on the low side as the ideal pressures for GT3 tyres are around 26 psi and adding one PSI to each of the cold temps got everything into the right working range. As an aside, all of the important corners on the Donington National Circuit are right-handers, so the right-hand tyres being a bit on the cool side is no problem at all. Speaking of temperatures, with a difference in surface temperature across the tyre of plus or minus 5 degrees, I tried reducing the camber a little, but it didn't have a positive effect on the lap times and it cooled the tyres slightly overall, so I ended up leaving them at the default value. Now, with the tyres at the right pressure and the temperatures behaving themselves, I was able to run consistently quicker, and dramatically so. 7 tenths of a second on such a short lap is a big improvement, and this reinforces the idea that getting the tyres working properly is absolutely critical. The next thing I wanted to tackle was the oversteer problem, and sorting the turn in oversteer first felt like the most logical place to start. After all, the way you enter a corner has a pretty big impact on the way you exit. There are a few things we can do to tackle turn-in oversteer. For example, you could stiffen the front anti-roll bar to induce a little turn-in understeer. But when I was looking at the stock setup, it was evident that the car was running a huge amount of front toe out. And decreasing this by a couple of clicks to a less extreme setting solved the turn-in issue completely. I tried to go further, as less toe angle means less rolling resistance, but it started to introduce some understeer. Those two clicks gave me another two tenths of a second. Power oversteer was the next problem to be solved. Even with aggressive traction control intervention, the Audi in stock form really wants to rotate on corner exit. Now, I'd normally have a look at softening the rear anti-roll bar, but it's already at its softest setting, so the next most logical choice is to reduce the differential power locking. This took a little bit of faffing about with to find a setting I was happy with. Dropping it down two clicks from 60 to 40% felt great, but it was less quick, so I settled on 50, which seemed like a decent compromise. More importantly, it allowed me to drop the traction control setting all the way down. I like to keep it turned on at a low setting as a bit of a comfort blanket, even if it's not doing anything. 
While I was playing with the diff, I increased the coast locking by two clicks to 70% to get rid of that nasty lift off oversteer, and it did. This can introduce understeer if you're not careful, but it was fine in this case. So by this stage, I had a car that was behaving itself through every phase of the corner, and all in all, it was starting to feel pretty good. The last few changes didn't really impact my peak lap times, but my consistency increased dramatically as the handling became much more predictable. I went back to the stock setup at this stage to see whether the improvements were genuine or imagined, and I immediately went a second a lap slower. Now that the car had a pretty decent balance, it was handling the kerbs a little better than in its stock state. However, there still wasn't enough confidence in the car to attack the kerbs properly. Now, ideally you'd like to soften the springs a little, but this is an aero car and we want to keep the ride height nice and stable. Moreover, the springs are actually pretty soft on the Audi to start with, so let's take a look at the dampers to see what's going on there. Because we're talking about bumps and kerbs, the fast settings are what we're interested in. And interestingly, the damper values are pretty similar for both the bump and rebound. This flies in the face of most advice that suggests that the rebound value should be higher than the bumps, some saying as much as 1.5 to two times higher. I played around for a while looking at replays to see how the car was behaving on the kerbs. I initially expected to lower the fast bump settings to make the car a bit more stable, but in the end it looked and felt at its most settled with the fast rebound settings increased by five clicks all round. After extensive testing, I ended up back at the stock values for ride height, rake and wings. Let me explain why. I use the wings app to get data on the downforce, drag and top speed figures for a variety of setups. These range from the default through to a selection of low and high downforce setups, as well as some experimentation with the effect of ride height and rake. You'll notice I've not added lap times to the chart, and that's because there was such slight variation between the times that the data was well within the margin for human error so it wasn't all that instructive. I won't bore you with a blow-by-blow -blow account here, but what I learned was this. Low ride height and more positive rake do have an impact on the Audi, but at the speeds we're talking about at Donington, it makes no real difference to lap time. Similarly, with the wings, you can see the effects of reducing the wings on top speed is absolutely minimal, while adding more downforce didn't make enough of a difference through the corners to overcome the slower top speed. After gathering a decent amount of data, I came to the conclusion that the default values felt best for Donington. Though, I would expect a faster track to have gone with a lower downforce setup with a decent amount of rake. The final area to address was the Everest-like gearing. Since the back straight's pretty short, there's not a lot of room to get up to speed, so sacrificing top-end acceleration is a no-brainer. I went all the way to the bottom and installed the shortest final drive, and there's still a little bit of headroom left. If I wanted to, I could have started reducing the individual ratios as well, but the car felt good and there was no need to shift in undesirable places, so I decided to leave it be. With the last few changes in place, I ran some laps with what felt like a planted, fast race car. And after getting used to the new gearing, I was able to run a few laps in the low 1 minute fives before breaking into the 1 minute 4 bracket, just. To be honest, with 30 litres of fuel on medium tyres, being half a second off the hot lap pace is pretty decent in my book and bolting on a set of soft tyres immediately found another three tenths. So, from my perspective, the setup feels good to drive and is delivering pretty quick lap times. So, that's how I go about building a setup. I hope that's been helpful to some of the guys that have stuck around through the whole series. As you can see, applying the theory usually works up until the point where it doesn't. Most of the setup changes I made to the Audi did what I expected, but when it came to the dampers and to some extent the aero, I was left having to experiment to make sure I didn't get led down the wrong path. And really, that's what it's all about. Apply the principles, but trust your gut, and more importantly, the timing screen. So that just about wraps things up for this video and for the series. Thanks to everyone that stuck around and listened to me prattle on about car setups for what I think works out about the same length of time as it would have taken for you to watch this is Spinal Tap. If you enjoyed the series, then it would be great if you could hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. And if you think the video will be helpful for others, then please consider sharing it. As always, thank you for donating your precious free time by watching. It is very much appreciated. So all that's left to say is goodbye, thank you for watching, and enjoy the rest of your day.